intersection of uh, lifelong learning in the workplace. I am Rachel Borg. I am with Pearson, and I have my colleagues with me uh, in this. Kim Jones with Community America Credit Union, Papazese with Avon Help, and Kuntal McElroy with Axiom Vantage. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, really quick, I wanted to, ooh, my slides are not advancing. Let's try this. All right, um, just so you guys have a, a bit of a context of who we are, I'm part of Pearson. Pearson is the world's learning company. Um, our strategy is pretty simple. It consists of three main pillars to advance equity in learning, build skills for a sustainable future, and lead by example, which is something that I think we are gonna touch on today, actually, in our topic of conversation. Um, my actual team that I'm with is part of a, a group called Pearson Accelerated Pathways. We work with organizations on reimagining uh, education and learning and development in the workplace uh, to drive strategies that really enhance human, your human capital. Um, and I'm happy to uh, show anyone kind of what we do. And obviously we have a booth if you guys would like to visit that a little bit later. Um, but thanks everybody for being here. Um, just a couple bullets on what you can expect from us today. Uh, we're actually going to go through some research and insights about lifelong learning and how it's viewed by key stakeholders in the ecosystem. Get our expert panelists perspectives on the last two decades of uh, lifelong learning and how organizations have fostered it. Um, identify areas in which CLOs will need to focus their attention to meet the needs of learners and engage in a discussion with you. Um, we've talked about this at nauseum. I think that we would love for all y'all to participate throughout. Um, obviously, submit your questions or thoughts or comments in the chat as we go through research and engage with our panelists in this discussion. We're hoping that this is going to be uh, very interactive for all of you. Um, I think this is um, not irony, but we started this conversation with sort of the change in uh, decades. So obviously, kicking off 2020, and that was supposed to be sort of the look back and look going forward. Um, obviously, we are in unprecedented times that's really advancing a lot of this conversation now. Um, and so while we don't necessarily want to talk about what's going on, we can't help but to um, not avoid the topic of conversation. But I think what we're going to share today is, is relevant. Why this conversation? I think we all um, have expressed um, some interest in this as well. And I've heard this from different panelists at this event that the current model of lifelong learning is inadequate and unable to keep up with the rate of change, which is exponentially changing now uh, the last several months. Um, several players in the ecosystem have not yet made the shift from knowledge stocks to knowledge flows, and we'll kind of show what that looks like based on the research. Um, traditional learning pathways for acquiring skills and credentials and securing employment are in flux now more than ever. Um, Certainly, obviously, this is a hot topic of conversation. We know that 54% 54 of the workforce, based on um, some of the information from the World Economic Forum, some great research that's out there on the future of jobs, 54% uh, of the workforce will require significant upskilling and reskilling in the next five years. I think certainly now more than ever, if this research was redone, um, we'd see this number actually grow. 80% uh, of business leaders believe that more innovation is needed in learning and development. And so we know that um, obviously there are changing demands. Pre-COVID, obviously the, the economy was doing really well um, with low unemployment rates, um, workforce retirement being a factor, automation and AI being a factor, um, and jobs were in flux, but also skills demands were on the rise. Um, and so this conversation is still obviously incredibly relevant. Um, I don't know if, if you guys have seen this research. Um, there was an article that was put out in Forbes in March, um, but basically, the rate of acceleration for the coronavirus based on the transformation is, is actually mirroring that of what is typically driven by technology. Um, and so you'll see here, um, depending on how long this lasts, the rate of change is going to be um, um, one that is going to be hard to kind of fathom uh, based on everything that is going on. And so we need to prepare um, and discuss new ways of doing business, new ways of learning and new ways of preparing our workforce. So what does lifelong learning mean? Um, I think this is probably debatable, but it's got a couple key factors that are important for everybody to think about. 
It is the ongoing um, law, voluntary and self-motivated pursuit of knowledge. So those three things are critical. Um, it's also about enhancing your self-sustainability as well as competitiveness and employability. Um, employability has been a mission of Pearson's for some time and essentially it means providing individuals the skills that they need to stay sustainable in the workplace and to continuously be employed and productive. Um, and so learning is certainly a, a part of that. Um, I also threw a quote in there about uh, from, from Harvard Business Review from a couple of years ago, but basically the quote talks about learners being made, not born. Um, and then there's a deliberate use of practice of dedicated strategies to really sort of create these lifelong learners. Um, and so to kick off this discussion, I'm going to turn to Hap Aziz with um, a little bit of philosophy on your part regarding that quote and some of this kind of kickoff here. Um, do you believe lifelong learners are born and created? Um, or could this, if they are, if this is true, basically, could this be the reason why um, this ecosystem uh, is vastly different, sees vastly different outcomes from their programs? And Hap, I'm going to ask you to start. I'm going to ask my panelists to kind of weigh in on this. And I would like for you guys to each introduce yourselves a little bit more if that's possible. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Sure, thank you. Um, as Rachel said, my name is Hap Aziz. Hap is short for happy, so that makes it somewhat easy to remember. And uh, I've been involved in learning in some form or another for the past 30 years or so of my career. This particular question about lifelong learning is, is something that I've thought about um, quite a bit. And I think part of it is I'm going to get a little bit lawyerly and, it's, and I'm going to say it depends on what one means about learning. If anyone has held a newborn baby, you know that that's the greatest learning machine that God or nature has ever created. Immediately from coming out of the womb, the baby is using all of its senses to try to figure out what's going on. And that baby that doesn't have language, that doesn't have a schema about the world, over time will gather all of these things and learn about his or her environment and will essentially practice lifelong learning in an informal sense. I think where the, the challenge is, is when we talk about lifelong learning more formally, like through the, the Harvard definition, and we think about learning associated with particular outcomes. And I think what we've done as a society is backed ourselves into a corner. Naturally, I believe that learners are, bor are born because that's how we're built. That's, that's all of our genetic makeup leads us to learn. However, as a society, we've created infrastructures that really get more in the way of learning than facilitate learning. And that's where we're in the, in the problem that we are now. And I'll, real briefly, I'll tie it back to one invention of technology, and that's the invention of the alphabet. Before that, people learned by doing. I would take my child out, teach him or her how to hunt by handing the child the spear, letting it pull the spear and figure out how to throw the spear. Nowadays, it's read chapter one through three on how to use a spear. And after you've taken the assessment, I'll determine if I can let you hold the spear. It's the invention of the alphabet that turned learning from an activity to first you had to learn how to code and decode information symbolically before you could actually learn what it is you're trying to learn. And it's that process and processes like that that get in the way of actual learning. We're trying to learn the infrastructure of learning and not the content itself. So that's a little bit of what I think. Good, thank you. You took it all the way back to, I was just looking at the last 10 to 20 years of your experience, you took it all the way back to the caveman days. <laughs> well, that, that's where we learned naturally. We learned the way we were built to learn. Really quick, uh, Kim, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and just real quick touch on this. And, and um, in the context of sort of the last 10 to 20 years, as well as um, in the context of the organization, um, what do you think about this quote? Yeah, you know, thank you, Rachel. And uh, Kim Jones, uh, learning leader, uh, as Rachel said earlier, with Community America Credit Union. I've uh, been in learning and development for over 20 years in a vast um, different industries, uh, security, manufacturing, and now financial services. So excited to be here today and talk about this topic. Uh, as I shared with Rachel earlier today, when I first had this question posed, I thought, gosh, you know, I think it's, it's a born you know, trait to be a lifelong learner. But the more I thought about it, it's, it's also part of being created. And it's, it's being a self-motivated learner. And 
our drive to learn more in the organization or in our own life is often drawn from, you know, again, our motivation and our experiences. And the things that are, you know, a better experience, we're gonna be more driven to and to do more of that. So the more we have those positive experiences in our learning ecosystems and this in the structure to support it, uh, the more driven our learners will be. Awesome. And Ms. Kuntal. Yeah, I mean, so, so Kuntal McElroy, I, uh, I'm a lifelong learner myself. I can, I can definitely claim that. And uh, like Kim and oh. Hap, uh, been touching learning somehow or another, whether it was teaching in academia or doing consulting work or, uh, you know, just being a learning leader within an organization. So um, my, you know, when I read that quote, I, I believe that we're all born natural learners. Um, and it's, the the Harvard Business Review quote to me is more about the how. So I think, you know, we there is the power of the how, how we actually continue to um, differentiate learning and, and, and align it to the interest that the learner has. So how do we make it learner-centric? Uh, a simple example, and go back to a similar analogy as Hal used, it's just think about children that we raise, right? All of us have families. And why do these children turn out different? And why do they have different skills? It's the environment in which we are teaching them certain things that's actually having an effect as well. So um, I think it's a combination. I always love research statements like this because they leave room for a healthy debate and allow us to really start thinking more strategically, so. Awesome. Thank you. And I think that's what we're looking to have is a, a healthy debate and just a conversation about something that we've all been doing for the last uh, many, many years. And um, so let's get into the research a little bit. Um, we're going to pull on some research from McKinsey as well as from Deloitte. But I think this model is really interesting. And this was put together by uh, the wonderful Nick Van Dam, who obviously many of you know. Um, he's, he um, produced an article that talked a little bit about sort of the past, present, and future. Um, but, but historically speaking, the way systems kind of worked in this ecosystem, and when I say ecosystem, it's the learner, it's that organization, it's the educational institutions, and it's others that um, are part of this, is, is this what he called the T model. Um, but when you look at it, it's really a little bit lopsided. Um, and you can see why, because you're talking um, roughly, you know, 50 years in the workplace, potentially, um, maybe less, obviously, if you're lucky. Um, but you've got this deep expertise that's built up with sort of this one and done journey that generally is um, your college experience, right? And college, based on some of the research shown and some of the things we're going to talk about today, was really built to efficiently quickly and efficiently get people into the workplace, but it wasn't built for lifelong learning and sustainability throughout the course of, of somebody's career. So you have some advanced degrees and things like that, but what the research has shown is that we need more than that. And so what has happened is organizations have picked up a lot of that work. Um, today, I believe $160 billion a year is spent on training and development according to training industry. And so that's where you spend the money and get the, the systems in place to build these broad competencies and to really support somebody's lifelong learning needs in the workplace. But it's heavily driven by being on the job. And as more and more individuals change jobs and change careers and need to upskill and shift and technology kind of pushes this, this model is falling, right? So it's no longer sustainable to even be a T. It's more of like an L and it's, it's tipping over. Um, Another, another slide I'm gonna show here is, um, advance the deck, is that uh, this is actually something that Deloitte put out and it's a little bit focused on the traditional pathways of learning, which also supports what Nick kind of put together for McKinsey. But essentially you see this sort of very traditional pathway of, of learning where you have the educational ecosystems, you have the, the companies themselves, and you have sort of um, education built for a specific occupation. And, and if you ask anybody um, if they are actually in a field um, that they actually studied in school, I believe the number is, is 60 plus percent go on to do something different in their first job based on um, what they actually studied in college. So it's, it's uh, kind of an interesting stat. We all know this. Um, I, for one, was one. Um, but traditional pathways, they tend to be disconnected, they tend to be disjointed, and more and more and more, obviously, they're increasingly unaffordable. And so 
relying on this ecosystem to sort of produce this deep spill skills expertise that is needed for new ventures, for new upskilling, for new occupations, for the future of work, it's not going to work. Um, and in fact, more than 40% of recent graduates from four-year colleges can't find jobs. I think this number is unfortunately gonna grow. I mean, this has obviously been on the news. What are the, the graduates of 2020 going to do from a work perspective? And so this is becoming more and more of a hot topic and something that needs to be addressed. Um, not just within organizations, not just from the recruitment side, but also what are uh, schools and other players in the ecosystem going to do to address these, these needs. Um, so based on some of this traditional learning, um, and I believe Kim, I'm gonna kick this one over to you first, but based on your career in learning and development, um, do you think this research is accurate? Does it make sense? Um, and then how have these traditional learner, uh, traditional lifelong learning models worked or not worked based on yeah. your perspective? Yeah, thank you, Rachel. And I think it's a great question. You know, I go back, you know, many years ago of a lot of, you know, corporate university programs where, you know, we were building tracks where, you know, it was kind of a, a one size fits all approach. And depending on, you know, what level of leader you were or how much experience you had as a leader, you were kind of following the same trajectory of the courseware that was being offered to you. Um, and I think more days today, it's, it's, it's having that adaptive learning approach and having more of a conversation of, you know, that experiential learning and talk about our experiences and the reaction of us, you know, in the jobs and actually doing the work and having those, you know, ritual conversations um, about our experiences and, and providing content, you know, to the learner when they need it and having them have the opportunity to kind of pick and choose, you know, their course work over time uh, that's more, you know, tailored to them. So I, yes, I think uh, we have definitely uh, changed uh, and we're adapting, but I think we still have a lot of work to do on that in this area. I think it also shows and also supports why so much money and time and investment have been put into learning and development. Obviously, if, if the, the bulk of somebody's career was, was spent getting the skills that they needed on the job, it certainly justifies everybody's role. Um, obviously, right? <laughs> Kuntal, thoughts? Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think- You probably as, have many. I, okay. I have many as usual. Um, I will tell you that, um, you know, when I think about the learning and development space and I think about what some of the challenges are there, uh, there are some realities today that we face uh, as organizations, as parents, et cetera, where, um, you know, at a high level, what we can learn and how we can learn, there's, there are abundant choices now. Like if you think back to, I'm dating myself now, I'm old enough to say that when I was growing up, the choices were limited. Given that we have such a broad uh, opportunity to have all the different choices and then marry that with the, the part around technology impacting growth and change across families, companies, whatever you look at, I think that has created some of the challenges because some of these models that were built were built at a time with a purpose and the purpose and the time now demand for something different. Yes. Pat? I agree with that statement that Kuntal made just, just now. I, I agree with that 100%. The, the, and the systems that were built were built in a different time to a different purpose. And a lot of that purpose was built to make things convenient for an organization, convenient for an organization to track data, convenient for an organization to see what learners were doing. If you think about the uh, current corporate LMS, that's a lot of how it's built. It's built to give a view of data, but it's not necessarily built to provide learning in a way that the learner will be able to consume it easily truly wherever and when, whenever they want to. And that's why we're seeing now the rise of the learning experience platform, which is a, a sort of an inverted view of learning mechanism. But currently where we are, we have an infrastructure that's very technology heavy. And as we see now where people are being sent home to work, the, the infrastructure is collapsing when we cannot provide um, seven layers of IT tech support behind the learners. So something yeah. needs to change where learning can be much simpler, more like picking up a book off a shelf 
as opposed to logging in and multiple systems and forgetting your password, having your video go down, maybe internet's working, maybe you have internet, I don't know, all of those things. So we, we are in a position where we get to reinvent how organizations serve up learning so that the end user can consume it in an easy and comfortable and intuitive way. So I'm going to ask you a question because I, I this is not baked, um, but obviously it's kind of coming from this flow is, do you think these systems were built with a learner in mind? Or do you think that they were built based on, you know, somebody's kind of profitability metrics, et cetera? Um, I, I'll just say no, they were not built with a learner in mind. They were built with what learning experts or educators thought the learning, sh the learner should have. But if you think about it, if I go back to my days in, uh, in, in, in academia and of the thousands of online courses that I've had a hand in collaborating with other faculty or building on my own, not once did we take students into a room and try out the online course and say, what do you think? And then make revisions based on that. So um, no, it's, it's not really built with the learner in mind. It's built with what we think the learner has in mind. And, and Rachel, if I could add to that, I think, you know, as we're looking at this, I think the mismatch between what an organizational strategy is uh, and you, you compare that to what a people strategy might be for an organization, marry that to uh, sort of the leadership and cultural environment. And then finally, you get down to the actual individual and what their passions are, right? At the end of the day, most learners or employees who you know they come to the table with the intention of trying to do good work be successful at it and be able to continue to grow so that personal growth element is like five layers deep and we've got all of these infrastructure that's addressing learning and education and credentials in a very siloed way and uh, we've gotten into this world where there's so much, so many choices. Today, if I wanted to learn something, I don't have to necessarily go to school. I could get online and learn something, right? Okay. If I wanted to go to school, I have the choice to go to school, but then I'm going to have a different expectation of what I will get out of it. So right. all of that has come to uh, really a, a peak now. And it, this becomes a very important dialogue for us to have within this industry around what does it mean when we talk about lifelong learning? Yeah, I'm going through this experience now as a um, as the, the chief uh, teacher at my house with my children, and uh, right now I will say we are very fortunate to be in a school district that has technology for my kiddos, um, but it is not a cohesive, well knit together process. And if this is what they were left to rely on every day, we are absolutely pulling our hair out, um, just trying to find, because it's been like an egg hunt every day. So I can only imagine, um, you know, what somebody would go through if they didn't have the systems and stuff in place. Certainly as a, a solutions uh, designer from the learning side, I'm seeing all the things that are wrong <laughs> with this experience, but I think it's certainly, there's a lot to be learning uh, from this. And I hope folks are really paying attention. I think it's gonna be really interesting to see what comes out of, of all of this, obviously, um, and to minimize the frustration, uh, certainly taking that into consideration is key, right? So, uh, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna move on with some of the slides here because I want to make sure we kind of get to some of this. So, um, hold on. there we go. Um, so kind of a follow-up to what Nick had put together on the T model for McKinsey, he went from basically saying that this model needs to evolve from being a brand strategist to an industry strategist and having multiple touch points throughout one's career where you go, essentially go deep in terms of the expertise. And I think part of this is part and parcel that, you know, are we really studying the competencies of, of, of our individuals that work for us? Are we building training to make them efficient in certain areas and help them transition. I think it's it's a struggle for organizations. And, and you know, the other thing is, is that performance development was put back into the hands of learners many years ago. And so it's sort of up to you to, to paint that path for yourself. But it really takes a blend of, of having the right coach and mentor to help lead you down that path. 
Um, but I think what the what the research is basically saying is that there needs to be more integration, right? So no longer can we have quote unquote crossroads or quote unquote intersections. That's not even the right term anymore. It has to flow together and it has to be sort of one and the same thing. I also look at it as there's there's a lot of of deep expertise and skill sets and subject matter that is um, in a lot of different places. And I think typically as organizations, sometimes we think about how do we develop this on our own and and recreate the wheel, but that's not necessary. How do you sort of take advantage of what else is out there in the ecosystem to have a truly balanced career, which quite honestly is probably going to be several um, different skill sets and several different things over the course of somebody's life, right? So this is where this M, this M model comes in. Um, and secondary to that as well, uh, Deloitte also kind of talked about what are the emerging pathways and what should learning of the future look like. Um, and what you see here is really something that is much more integrated. Um, I think meaningful, which is really important. That's an important term for us as well at Pearson, but how do you make sure that the interventions that are taking place are meaningful and that they fit somebody's life based on this, the needs that they have and the skills that they are potentially lacking? Um, and so as organizations, part of that is we need to um, build with that in mind, as well as incorporate the broader kind of ecosystem into what we're doing from a strategic perspective. And so really this should be a continuous loop um, where there are kind of ins and outs and the ebb and flow that does incorporate a variety of sort of going deep and going wide as part of our development. But it really is just saying at a, at a high sort of simple level is we have to be more integrated. Um, that we've been built for different purposes. Now we have to change, recognizing that we may have three to five different pathways that we go on upon, uh, you know, in our career journeys that we may do different things that's going to require different deep skills, expertise. And we need to, as an organization, unite this together. I mean, typically these are separate budgets, separate teams. Um, they fight for the same money um, under HR potentially. They don't necessarily work together. But if we think about the learner at the forefront of that, how do we make that happen in a more continuous loop? Um, as a follow-up to that, I, I love um, our buddies Degreed. I know they're at this event. Um, I love this, this chart that they put together years ago and I know that they still use it. Um, and it's actually available in their most recent piece of research. So shout out to them, um, How the Workforce Learns uh, 2019. I think it's actually in their booth. Um, but as basically this chart kind of, if you look at this and sort of ponder it, you've got learning experiences that are essentially owned by the learner. They're, they're quick, they're easy, they're inexpensive to free, and they, they happen at a higher frequency. And then as you kind of go on through somebody's journey throughout the year, you have these various interventions. Um, I think part of this is, is the less often is gonna become a more concentrated, strategic, prescriptive path for each person. So less often is gonna get more definition to it. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, that is important to think about. But essentially this research also shows that sort of the big buckets of where people typically learn include um, articles, so reading, books, webinars, and then essentially courses that they kind of go seek out on their own. And a lot of that is not supplied by the organization, right? So just recognizing how somebody goes through that journey, how they're curious, how they maintain their skill sets and where they learn is important, but also being strategic about how other parts are incorporated into that journey is going to be key. Um, this is really quick, just uh, this is based on some, some Pearson research and things that we have, but as we look at how another component of the ecosystem academic institutions are changing, um, they are rapidly, uh, aggressively exploring new business models so that they can become more frequent and relevant to that lifelong learning journey. And so it, it comes at a variety of price points, it comes at a variety of of um, interventions that take a certain amount of time to complete from low to, to, to more, which is where you're gonna see sort of the degrees. But essentially, how do we incorporate more of this into the work that we do within the organization so that we're not also building this out on our own and relying on subject matter expertise that exists out there in the market. So this is really sort of how do we knit all this together? And this is where this conversation is going, right? So I am going to kick it to my next question and I'm going to start with you, Kuntal. Um, based on these models, based on everything that we've started kind of talking about here, the research shows that lifelong learning ecosystems, they need to be established. Um, various stakeholders need to be involved, providing key components 
Um, do you agree or disagree with some of these emerging trends? And, and do you think organizations are ready to manage these new models? So that's multiple questions, first of all. <laughs> I'll try to answer them all uh, the best I can. Um, I will tell you that for me, the, the most uh, important piece that's coming out as we look through what's happening in our environment is that a lifelong learning ecosystem is a must. Like there is no, we, we really don't have a choice not to create something that promotes lifelong learning ecosystem. Now, marry that with the fact that when you looked at the research around whether it's the M model or the T model, to my previous statement, I think some of these models were built at a, for a time and for a specific purpose. That does not mean that all of those things become irrelevant as we go into the future. But how do we, how do we, strategically think through, uh, for example, if, if you're an organization, how do you think through what is the learning strategy that you need to have that actually supports your people strategy as well as enables your business to do what you need to do? And at the end of the day, technology has, has created a, 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 an even playing field where sometimes now small players can come in and, and, and shake up the big players. So in that environment, how you manage the growth opportunities for your people asset, right? And I hate calling people assets, but at the end of the day, most companies can distinguish themselves today uh, merely by the quality of the people that they have and the service that they provide because machines can pretty much do things identically. So as I look through that, um, uh, specific to this question, I think, um, the emerging trends are, are very clear. Uh, I think as organizations, we don't have a choice but to start thinking about how do you put uh, a model that is learner-centric but is aligned with what the business needs. Because at the end of the day, if a business was going to do everything every employee wanted, you would have to close shop. You couldn't afford to do that. So how do you build that learning strategy that actually facilitates your business ambition and bring it, to, uh, it, it together in such a way that you have a leadership and uh, organizational environment that promotes that. Because ultimately, you know, you had a long definition for lifelong learning. For me, lifelong learning is a shared responsibility. Everything we've talked about, everybody, every stakeholder that you've mentioned or the uh, players you've mentioned, they have a responsibility towards helping us as humans continue to grow. So that's, that's how I look at this. Sorry guys, just unmuting myself. I just realized I didn't answer the last question. See, there were lots of questions. I'm, I'm looking at this <laughs> slide going. So are organizations ready to manage this new model? I think um, most probably are not. Um, I don't know if anybody is, I can't speak for the organizations, but I can tell you, that I'm seeing enough curiosity across the board in many organizations where I see there's a dedicated effort, an intentional effort to try and figure out how do we become that organization that will provide the lifelong learning. Especially now, I think this has been a very hot topic. Obviously, everybody's, I think the census that I've got over the last two days is, is we're all recognizing this needs to happen, but it's, it's more of a okay, now what would we do moment? Because I think this wasn't part of the discussion um, and certainly it needs to be now. Um, Hap, any thoughts from you on this? I think part of it is um, uh, there's going to need to be a better partnership between industry, organizations, and our institutions of learning. So we're, we're looking at often in, in, uh, in the corporate world, we often bemoan the fact that we're getting people that are graduating from their schools and they're not coming out with the skills that we want. Well, part of that is there ought to be some better communication, some collaboration as to what those skills are and how to prepare the, uh, the graduates to enter the workforce with those skills. But I think a lot of it will go even further back because I like to go back in time and talking about um, uh, uh, elementary education students and how do we cultivate curiosity to be systematic and to be detail oriented so that these traits are, are, are cultivated in first grade, second grade, third graders, and they follow the, the, the learner through life 
so that when they enter the corporate space, they're still that curious. They're still looking at how to solve problems. They're still looking at how to get to answers for questions because they have a natural desire to get those, to those answers and not because they're just being told by their supervisor that they need to do a task. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm looking into the chat and, and Jim Duran kind of brought up a point and I think this is important and I know we touched on it, but we haven't touched on it enough. And that's really around, and basically the, the gist of it is, is that there's plenty of resources, there's no shortage of resources, uh, but it really comes down to the, the measurement, right? And the results and how do we incorporate what's best of breed? How do we incorporate what works? How do we know what works? How do we know what we need to make it work? Um, so Kim, I'm gonna I toss that to you. <laughs> um, so based on this question, also based on Jim's comments as well, thoughts on this? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, a, a great comment there. And I saw the same commentary on the chat and um, thought it was good to bring up that it, the key is, is after these investments are made inside the organization and the delivery of these programs, the key is, you know, going back to your, your leadership and explaining the value of some of these programs and what the return on the organization is uh, for making these investments. And um, as Kantal talked about the people strategy, um, it's also key to, you know, where are your, uh, you know, leaders and employees moving throughout the organization? Uh, what's their career path and, you know, the development of them leading to within the organization? Because as the research also says, you know, employees that are invested in and uh, they're going to, you know, stick with the organization feeling like they're valued. So the key there is showing the measurement of some of these programs and the value. So I know we've got, we're actually doing really good at time, which is awesome. We've got about seven minutes left. Um, I'm going to move on here for just a minute. Um, and I'm going to talk about this, this conversation around employability, which is so fundamentally important to us at Pearson. Um, but it, it truly is the most important outcome of learning, right? And so how do you, how do you create sustainable skill sets? How do you create the sustainability for individuals over the course of their lifetime? And how do we kind of frame the conversation around lifelong learning? And employability and, and marry those things up and, and what does that truly mean for an organization and part of that is is recognizing that we don't necessarily want to keep our talent over the course of x number of years based on whatever industry you're in um, that sometimes it is important to to develop talent for a certain role and then get them prepared for the next role which may be outside of your organization but we all have a role to play from a sustainability perspective um, to keep our companies um, afloat to keep industries afloat. We all have a role to play in that delivery of skills. Um, most working adults question whether they will have and continue to have the right skills. I think now more than ever, this is such an important conversation. Everyone agrees that the skills needed to succeed are changing. We don't necessarily know what they are. We're all trying to, trying to keep track of that. Um, but really having open conversations and having, having some skin in the game on all sides is really, really important. Um, most individuals will agree that they need more to be sustainable and to have that employability skill set going forward. Um, and so with that in mind, I'm going to kind of start to close this out, but I want to ask all of you, um, what things should CLOs be thinking about to prepare their organizations for the future of learning in the workplace? I think this conversation has been asked several times today in different contexts, and I think part of that is just based on what is happening. Uh, but Hap, I'm gonna start with you on this one. Sure, I'm, I'm gonna answer from a little bit of a metacognitive perspective and think about learning not as people should be learning skills, but more that people should be learning how to learn. And that's, that's a theme that's been pretty widespread in artificial intelligence research where people really determine that the folks like Mozart or Einstein, it's not that they're particularly more brilliant than other human beings, but it's they've learned ways to learn efficiently. And I think from an organizational perspective, that's what we're struggling to do right now, is to find ways to help our team members learn efficiently so they can get to their job quickly, they can do what they need to do with confidence, and they can feel that the organization is pouring into them and is caring for their professional development. Nothing is more frustrating for a learner than to 
go into an activity, you know, some sort of learning active, excuse me, activity that was assigned to them by their manager and then not understand what's going on. That's not a good situation. So for, from an organizational perspective, we have to help out our learners know how to learn and what to look for in identifying good learning and then go to that. Awesome. Kim? Yeah, I think it's key to be a, you know, a strategic business partner with the organization, um, be an influencer, uh, be a part of the change effort that's happening, and be willing to think differently and really innovate and design not for the future, but really design for today and, and be a part of the change effort that's happening inside the workplace. Kuntal? Lovely friend, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I try to go on mute in case there's a, a disturbance. But for me, I think um, I'm going to make, when, when I think about a chief learning officer's role, I think about the fact that it, for the future that we're looking at, it's a pivotal business enabler role. And what that means is knowing that uh, lifelong learning is a shared responsibility, the first thing is to really think through what is that learning strategy? How do you actually define learning as a business that actually supports the overall organizational business? I think that's, that's something that CLO should keep top of mind. The second, the second thing is really rethinking how learning in the workflow. So we've talked about throughout this conversation how it need, things need to be learner-centric. And obviously, one size does not fit all, and we can't do everything for every single person within an organization. So how can we design learning in the workflow in such a way that actually supports career ambitions? Because at the end of the day, people are coming to work because they want employment, because they want to be able to be relevant for the future and have the skills that are needed. And thirdly, I think this is an, a tremendous time, uh, and there's abundant opportunity to be able to innovate. But the question comes down to what does learning innovation look like um, in a world where companies now not only have to compete against their competitors, but have to constantly improve. So what we did today, if it is top notch, does not mean it will be top notch tomorrow, i.e. how do you get better? And that is a, that is a dilemma that companies face and human beings are the ones that will be able to address that because that's what we do from the moment we are born. We get to a point, we realize we're hitting a dead end and we need to grow. Uh, I can tell you from my personal journey, if I had to predict what I was doing today with my life 20 years ago, I would have lost all the money in the world if I bet on it, uh, what I thought I was going to do to where I am. And I think that's the general case for most of us in, in the work that we do. Perfect. Um, so really quick, I just wanted to kind of leave everybody with, with their key takeaways for this conversation. I think we've all agreed that previous models of lifelong learning are not built to support the future of work. Um, organizations need to play a stronger role in unifying the stakeholders in lifelong learning ecosystem. They need to kind of recognize who those are both internally and externally and unify them. Systems of lifelong learning could replace performance management and other antiquated measures as continuous skills attainment becomes uh, so important. And I think Hap touched on some of this a little bit um, with the need to teach people how to learn as being, as being so critical. Um, and that these systems will need to transform quickly and they'll be measured by things like their affordability, frequency, efficiency, and access. Um, I know that we are almost out of time. If folks have a few minutes, I'm happy to um, stay on and take any questions that may come through. Um, I apologize, I'm not able to advance the slides. And I did promise to send out the link to everybody. Um, so do we have any questions from folks at this point? Sorry guys, I can't advance the slides and my computer I think is frozen up. Potential. Oh, there we go. Okay, I don't see any questions from anybody here. I'm going to uh, 
close it out. If you guys want these slides, go ahead and, and pull them down. They're at our gettalk.at forward slash Pearson. Um, I think this is also available in our booth and the slides are also on that. So if you would like to visit that and click on that, our slides are in there for you to take away. Uh, we appreciate everybody's time today and uh, look forward to engaging in this discussion as the um, event wraps up. Thanks so much, everybody.